Hi, this is Simon Candy from AcousticGuitarLessonsOnline.net and in today's video I'm going to answer questions that you've asked me in the comments section below various videos on the channel. Now I'm sure I've already answered these questions in those comments, however of course in video form I can answer them much better and in more detail. So today that's exactly what we're going to do. In this Q&A session we cover topics including effective ways to solo using the major pentatonic scale, how to best place the index finger when playing bar chords for a nice smooth sound, how to write chord progressions using the aeolian mode, whether or not modes can change during a single song. Other things we cover will include picking on chords and particular schools of thought in terms of how to pick down up if there's a system to follow there, as well as the all-important question I know you've all been waiting for an answer and that is do all Australians play mate and guitars? And yes, I have been asked that question several times, so I'm going to answer that also today. So let's get into it. Okay, so the first question comes from Jeff Mason, and he asked recently on a video if I had a particular approach for soloing with major pentatonic scales. I find that, and this was my own experience when I started learning guitar too, it was probably easier and certainly felt more natural for me to solo with the minor pentatonic scale, you know, all the bluesy sort of stuff and rock and their you know, all that sort of stuff. The major wasn't as easy for me in the beginning. Perhaps I just didn't quite understand how to use it. But anyway, do I have a particular approach? Yes, I do. Uh, several. And I'm going to quickly show you here right now, Jeff, and anyone else who wants to know about the major pentatonic scale. So I'm going to use the key of G major. And if we look at the key of G major, notice there are three major chords. There's G, there is C, and there is D major. Okay, what does that mean? Well, that actually means that we can use the G major, C major, and D major pentatonic scales to solo over anything in the key of G. Now, why is that? That's because each of those scales contain a um, different combination of five notes of the seven notes that exist in G major. So if we look at the key of G major, we see our notes G, A, B, C, D, E, F sharp, G. Now, if we look at which notes make up a G major pentatonic out of that, we see that we get G, A, B, D, and E. Okay, so G major pentatonic lives inside the G major key. That's probably obvious, right? However, what most people don't know is that the C major pentatonic lives inside the key too. It's just a different combination of five notes. There's gonna be overlap, but there's, it's gonna be different too. So C major pentatonic has the notes C, D, E, G, and A. So if we look at that in the key of G, there they are. They're all in the key. So C major pentatonic lives inside G major. And thirdly, D major pentatonic also lives inside the keys. We can see there, D major pentatonic has the notes D, E, F sharp, a and B all living inside, nested nicely inside the key of G. So that means we can use any one of those pentatonic scales in the key of G. Okay, so I'm going to demonstrate this to you because you're going to get a different result with each. Okay, so I've got a just a G backing chord here. So if we grab that, that's just a G major chord. Okay, and I'm going to use pattern one G major pentatonic, which is up here at the 12th fret. And we're going to hear that that's going to sound nice over the chord, right? Right, everything's nice. Okay, because you've got all the chord tones of G in there, G, B, D, so it's all fair game. However, what if I played D major pentatonic, okay, that's, I'm going to use the same pattern here, pattern one, okay, and to play D major you start at the seventh fret, let's hear that. Now you're going to find that it's not perhaps as immediately kind of into your ear perhaps, okay, and I'll explain why in a moment but you do get some nice tones there's the seventh there the f sharp is the major seventh we've got the b the a is the ninth and we've got the sixth or the thirteenth the e so we've got some nice extensions to the chord here as well as the b and d notes so you still got the third of the chord and the fifth of the chord so if you're wanting to resolve your lines into the chord a little more 
perhaps finish on a B or a D. But it sounds okay on the F sharp as well, or any of the extensions. Now if I go down to C major pentatonic, two frets lower than D major using pattern one. Okay, sounds okay, but again you've got to be careful where you finish the phrases, particularly with this one, because we've got the C note in the C major pentatonic scale. Over a G chord, the C is kind of a tone you want to avoid, or at the very least, not avoid totally, but don't resolve into it. So if I'm playing my C. It doesn't quite sound good, does it, if I rest on it. But I can use it as long as I don't sort of emphasize it by resting on it. Okay. So, now, here's the thing. Let me stop that track for a moment. When you play pattern one G major pentatonic and you finish on this note being the first note on the third string, it's a root note, so it's all good, right? In fact, I should probably keep this going, shouldn't I? Sounds good. But if I go down here, it's okay too. This is D major pentatonic. But if I do the same riff here, not quite. So the function of the notes all swap around when you go to D and C major. So at first it might sound a little off to you when you do it. You might not be able to get something that sounds pleasing to your ear. What I would say is persist, okay? Because you'll start to hear where the resolutions are. You're not always going to be in the same spot as they are with the straight up major pentatonic that matches the root of the key. Okay, it's going to be different. But it is going to give you access to different groups of five notes of the seven of the key. Okay, question two is from, I'm going to try and pronounce this correctly here, Hassam Abdul Karim. So hopefully I've done that some justice there, possibly not. But anyway, Hassam's question is all about the index finger when playing bar chords and more specifically, how far should you or do I extend the index finger from the top of the lip of the, the neck here. You know, is it okay to have it a reasonable distance above the, the tip of the, the top of the neck here, if you like? Um, and I think Abdul or, or Haram, Hassam, <laughs> I'm already butchering it, um, uh, has it a little above. Now, I would say that, you know, if your index finger extends a little bit beyond the, the, the tip of the, the top of the, the neck there is fine. Um, as long as it's not too much, you probably don't want to have it like this, where you've kind of got it down to the first knuckle joint there. If that's flush with the top of the neck there, it's probably a little bit too much, or certainly no more than that. Okay, I think with me, it certainly extends beyond, but not too much. It's sort of halfway between the tip of the finger and the, the, um, the first knuckle joint there. It's probably roughly where the, the neck lands with the, the back or the yeah with my index finger when I'm playing the bar chord okay so it, it might be slightly different for someone else we all have different sized fingers and and so forth so that's okay but you don't sort of want it like this where it's way past the the top of the neck there and you know um, so that's okay it doesn't have to be sort of you know flush with the tip of the the neck there because it's it's going to be very hard to fret the note if you did that anyway I'll link to a video in the top right corner just now there's a video I've got on bar chords that discusses this in a little bit more detail plus other tips for getting nice clean sounding bar chords. Okay the third question is from Moi Me <laughs> and it's to do with modes. Now I'm going to reference you or direct you to, um, this is anybody watching here, to a modal progression video I've done on the channel which goes into much more detail. I'll link that in the top right corner as well. So if I say anything here because we've only got you know it's beyond the scope of the video to go too deep here, um, so I'm going to assume a few things of you. However, if you don't understand a few things I'm talking about here, check out that video. It goes into much more detail. The, uh, the question here is about the Aeolian mode and about how the Aeolian mode has the same notes as C major and its parallel minor A. Okay, so A Aeolian and C major have the same notes. 
A aeolian and A minor, in the context of which we're talking about it here, don't only have the same notes, they are the same thing. A aeolian and A natural minor, or as we just say most times, A minor, are the same thing, one and the same. Now, the question more so here though is how do you create a chord progression in A aeolian? How do you know it's in A aeolian? Because in the video that I referenced just before, linked in the top right for you, is about writing chord progressions and you've got to target certain things to make it sound like that particular mode, okay? And in that uh, lesson, I was talking about writing chord progressions in minor modes. And if you are in the Dorian mode, for example, refer to the natural minor. So if I was playing or wanting to write an A Dorian chord progression, I would reference it against A minor, which is also A Aeolian, and see what the difference is. And if you do that, you'll see the difference is A Dorian has an F sharp in it, A minor or A Aeolian doesn't. It's just an F natural note. So you would want to target that note in your chord progressions to really sound out the Dorian. Now, I'm thinking the question here is that if we're referencing the mode against the minor, then how do you know if you're in a aeolian when it's the same as the natural minor. If I reference a aeolian with a minor, as you can see, same notes, because as I just said before, they are the same thing. It's just a different name for the same exact key. The question then, well, the answer I should say, is just do the reverse and look at what the difference is from aeolian to the Dorian mode, okay? And again, it will be the same thing. It's the F sharp. So if we look at both keys here, okay, a Aeolian has the F natural. A Dorian has the F sharp. Now you think one, no, okay, it's not that big a difference. No, not, not massively. They're close on the spectrum, but it is distinctly different. And one note changes three chords in the key. Three chords is almost 50% of the chords that you're going to use. Okay, so that's a little bit bigger when you think of it like that. So if we look at A Dorian, well, no, um, let's go A Aeolian, okay? What are the chords in the A Aeolian? We have A minor, okay, cool. We have B half diminished. We have C. We have a D minor. We have an E minor. We have an F. We have a G. And we have A minor, okay? Now, if we look at A Dorian, which has the F sharp, that changes things up a little bit. We have A minor. Now we have B minor, not B half diminished, because that F sharp changes that into a B minor chord. Then we have C. Now we have D, not D minor, because of the F sharp again in the key. Then we have E minor. We have F half diminished, F sharp half diminished, because of the F sharp, and G, and then back to A minor. So there's three chords different between the two keys. So when you're playing or wanting to write a chord progression in A Aeolian, then you want to target those chords that have the F or the F sharp, depending on which key you're in, so that you really, you know, accentuate. The characteristic note is what that is, okay? So the characteristic note in A Aeolian is that F. In Dorian, it's F sharp. So let me just give you a quick example here. If I write this chord progression, I'll play this in A um, Aeolian. A minor, D minor, quite a sad, mellow chord progression. Now, if I take that same chord progression and you know, play it in A Dorian, A minor, G, they're both from, they're from both the keys. So just playing those chords alone doesn't really distinguish whether I'm in one or the other. It's the D minor chord that gives me Aeolian. So if I was to play this in Dorian, that D minor becomes a D chord. It sounds like this, A minor, And this is why we say Dorian is a bit of a more optimistic of the minor modes, if you like. It's the brighter of the minor modes, um, if you're thinking of them along a spectrum. Dorian's going to be the brighter of the minor modes because of that raised sixth, okay, the F sharp, as opposed to the F in um, Aeolian. Okay, next question. Stephen Morley wants to know if modes typically change during a song and the answer is yes they do quite often a song that's does the same sort of thing but kind of in reverse is Rhiannon 
by Fleetwood Mac. That verse of that song is in um, A minor, right? It's got like the... Right, it's got that riff happening throughout, which is on an A minor chord. Etc. Right, and then when it gets to the chorus, it brightens up a bit because it's the goes to the C and to the F and to the C and the F, and I think it might hang on F, and then it's back to back. Hear the shift back to A minor there. Okay, if you look at the verse of that song, it's in A minor, A minor and F. If you look at the chorus of the song, it's in C major, C and F. Okay, so overall we'd say the song's in A minor because that's where it starts and I think that's where it might end. Can't remember. But um, if we look at it a little bit more carefully and separate out the verse from the chorus, we'd say yes, it's had a modal shift there. But both modes come from the parent key of C major. So that's why there's not a massive shift there. Can you switch from one mode to another that don't come from the same parent key? Absolutely, you can do anything. <laughs> but that is done. That's a little bit more in jazz, you hear a lot of that. Not just jazz, but that comes to mind. There's actually, there's a tune by Miles Davis, the great horn player, Miles Davis, um, called So What, off an album called Kind of Blue. And it, moves between D Dorian and E flat Dorian. Now, they're not from the same keys, okay? They're not modes of the same key, clearly, because <clears throat> we're using Dorian mode throughout the song, but we're changing tonal center for that Dorian mode. So with that song, you've got like a little riff that goes, something like this. something like that, right? And that's all around this D minor, D Dorian sound. And then it moves up half a key or um, a fret. Now we're in E flat. And then it goes back, etc. right? And the whole song goes back and forth between D Dorian and E flat Dorian. So it's an example of a song that does change modes and more obvious because both modes, it's actually the same mode, but from two different key centers. Okay, another question from Jeff Mason here about chordal picking. And he's wondering an approach for picking, like he's, he's suggesting, do you always alternate your pick when you are chordal picking, you know, picking the notes of a chord separately. And his rationale is that if you have one way to do it, then it's easier because you can always sort of do the same thing if you like. And that's that's true, but it's not always, if, if you only have one way to do something, then you're going to find that it's not always going to be the best way. So you might be able to be consistent with it, but it won't always give you the best results. I tend to, when I chordal pick, this won't always be the case, but I tend to pick down on the beat and up off the beat. Okay, and I think Jeff actually sort of is is um, referring to this, if I'm not mistaken, because he talks about it, um, when he's asking about my approach and what he does, he's it's sort of I think what he's alluding to here is what I'm going to actually say, because he talks about keeping the rhythm rhythmic motor running, and I know what you mean by that, Jeff, and that is correct. So let's say, for example, if I have a like, I'll just play on a single chord here, right? If I have like a C chord, it's very much like strumming. If I have a C chord and I strum, down, down, up, up, down, real common strumming pattern, right? Down, down, up, up, down. When I strum like that, I am strumming in accordance to the beat. So when I'm on the beat, I'm strumming down. When I'm off the beat, I'm up. One, two, and three, and four. One, two, and three, and four, right? Every time I'm on the down, the one, two, three, four, I'm strumming down. And every time I'm on the upbeat, the ends, I'm strumming up. One, two, and three, and four. If we take that same rhythm and apply it to chordal picking on the C chord, one, two, and three, and four, and one, two, and three, and four, I'm gonna pick the same way I was strumming. Down, down, up, up, down, up, down, down, up, up, down, up. Because every time I'm on the downbeat, I'm picking down, down, up, 
Okay, so if you follow that rationale with your picking, it'll work out for you most of the time. And it is consistent, even though it throws up different combinations of downs and ups, depending on the rhythm that you're picking, that's going to dictate the down ups. Even though that switches up, your approach doesn't. It's like it's just, a, and this is what I think Jeff is referring to as a little bit of a rhythmic motor. Your hand is sort of continually down, up, down, up, down, up. And, you know, if it's going to play on a particular beat or on an offbeat, then you'll know it'll be down if it's a non-beat and up if it's an off-beat. Now, that won't always be the case. If I'm playing something like, let's say I'm in 6-8 time and I'm playing like a straight sort of 8th feel, like uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, I would probably pick that down, 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 up, 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 down, 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 up, 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 1, 2, 3, 4. We kind of are on each of the beats there though, aren't we? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, well, yeah, we are two, three, but I'm not always picking down. I'm picking down, 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 up, 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 down, 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 up. Could I alternate that? Yes. Sort of seems a little unnecessary to do though. And I'd be more inclined for the pulse of six, eight, one, two, three, four. I'd be inclined to pick down, 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 up, up, up. Okay, and the question you've all been waiting for, this comes from Simon, great name, Simon Crundwell, Crundwell, I think, probably butchering that too. However, he did ask, does every Aussie play a mate and guitar? And the answer is yes. <laughs> no, they, they don't, but they are a very popular guitar here in Australia. They're actually made in my hometown where I am right now in Melbourne, Australia. Um, only about 20 minutes from here actually. Um, is where they make these guitars, maintenance, and of course they've been made very, f I mean they've been around longer than Tommy Emmanuel, but Tommy Emmanuel has certainly done a lot to sort of uh, give them recognition, although they are a great guitar and were before Tommy Emmanuel was around too. Um, beautiful guitars, but certainly made popular, or more popular I guess, with Tommy Emmanuel always, or having played maintenance for a fair portion of his career. This guitar, um, I've had for about 20 years. I think I bought this guitar in 2002, picked it up off the shelf, just felt great. Um, I don't have a whole lot of gear. I'm not a gearhead. I've got, you know, some acoustic guitars here that I use for various things um, and some other guitars, electric and so forth. But this is my main sort of one. I've been, it's been, uh, where's this guitar been? It's been around various spots in Australia, uh, Sydney, Brisbane, Adelaide. It's been um, many times overseas in America. It's been to... Uh, Chicago a lot of times, it's been to the UK, it's been to Japan um, and most times, vast majority of times, it's come back in one piece. I did lose it in San Francisco, I was on a train from uh, Seattle to San Francisco about five years ago. I got off at San Francisco, unfortunately the guitar did not, <laughs> um, but I was able to, to get it back so thank God for that. And there's another time I was coming back from the UK and it um, was left in Thailand. I had to divert to Thailand because of a delay and the guitar didn't end up <laughs> coming home from there. However, I knew, they knew where it was, so I knew it would come back in one piece. Let me know in the comments section below this video if there's any particular topics you'd like to see me cover in future videos for the channel. Ask questions, because as you know, <laughs> I answer them and you may well find one of your questions is covered in a future Q&A session. So ask away, don't be shy, I want to hear what you have to say. If you like this video then hit that like button, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already and of course hit the all important notification bell button so YouTube can tell you when I've released a new video. This is Simon Candy from AcousticGuitarLessonsOnline.net. As always, thank you for watching this video, I really appreciate your time and I look forward to seeing you in the next video.